Darwin's Doubt, part 13, and the last part. Darwin's Doubt, if you haven't been following, is a book by Steve Meyer, who uh, is author of Signature in the Cell, was at one time an oil industry geophysicist, and then uh, moved on and got his PhD from Cambridge in the philosophy of science. When he got interested in the origin of life itself, he is the director for the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute. Uh, and uh, he's had interest in this area before, has published an article which, uh, um, as we'll note, uh, got um, railroaded out without uh, anybody answering uh, its particular objections except for one paper which was on the internet and uh, never actually peer reviewed, but interestingly enough gets quoted anyway which I guess goes to show you that peer review isn't quite all of what it's cracked up to be. Um, uh, Darwin's Doubt, the cover, and the prologue says that the book is divided into three main parts, which it is. The mystery of the missing fossils, the Cambrian explosion itself, how to build an animal, the problem of information, and uh, it being critical to the Cambrian explosion. And then part three, after Darwin, what? The story so far, to get us uh, kind of caught up to speed a little bit, the sudden appearance of multiple life forms in the Cambrian was a major unsolved problem for Darwin himself, and the problem has only grown worse with the discovery of the Burgess Shale and the changing fossils. Um, the numbers are the subscript presentation in the book chapter as a superscript. The excuse that the precursors were soft-bodied and therefore not preserved has been refuted by the evidence. Claims that intermediates are really there are lacking evidence, as noted in chapter 3, and not really believed by most authorities. Um, in other words, there are arguments that don't really have much support. Genetics seems to demand intermediates if common descent is assumed. They ought to be there. The tree of life cannot be used as a counterbalance to the problem of the Cambrian explosion. And punctuated equilibrium cannot explain the Cambrian explosion either. The gaps are too large to paper over in that way. The reason why the Cambrian explosion is a challenge for Darwinism is that Darwinism has to explain the origin of massive amounts of information, not just Shannon information, but functional information. There has always been doubt that Darwinism was up to the job, but the work of Yaki, Sauer, and now Axe have made the job considerably more daunting. Steve Meyer, after those people's work had come out, wrote a book, er, pardon me, a paper that called attention to this work, the one referred to earlier on, only to see the paper put on a figurative index. It was in the peer-reviewed literature. It was. It was peer-reviewed. But it was taken out. And Richard Sternberg to be effectively excommunicated. The only paper to attempt an answer to Meyer's article was an internet article. And Meyer takes that article apart, showing that the article's main peer-reviewed support doesn't say what the article says it says. This was what is sometimes called a literature bluff. New developments in population genetics have made more clear the magnitude of the barriers to getting even small changes of DNA that are advantageous, especially in multicellular animals. Developmental gene regulatory networks, which are interlocking, can't change significantly without damaging or killing the creature, but they must change if we're going to give rise to a new body plan. So how do you do that without targeting the new developmental gene regulatory network? And epigenetic information also challenges Darwinism. Several modifications of or alternatives to Darwinian theory have been proposed, such as self-organization, evo-devo, 
neutral evolution, neo-Lamarckianism, and natural genetic engineering. Each of these has weaknesses, and perhaps the most profound common weakness to all of those theories is the inability to explain the origin of specified complexity or information, what was emphasized in part two. Intelligent design explains information well, and using abductive reasoning, standard in historical science, it is the best current explanation for the facts of the Cambrian explosion. It accounts for generating new form rapidly. It should be new forms. Generating a top-down pattern of appearance and constructing complex integrated circuits and the reuse of parts, the same part, in different settings. Intelligent design cannot be excluded from science by definition Unless the definition is either ad hoc, that is to say, intelligent design is not science, which is a kind of a, um, or it also excludes neo-Darwinism. So you can't just say it's not science and then let it drop from there. Now, we are in part three, after Darwin, what, and this is his wrap up. Um, chapter, What's at Stake. In the summer of 2002, I had the opportunity to hike up the Burgess Shale with a group of geologists, geophysicists, and marine biologists. Our group also included my then 11-year-old son and a teenage friend of his who was interested in the Cambrian fossils and the debate about Darwinism and design. When we got to the top of the mountain, I was unprepared for the impact the fossils would have on me. I had seen many fossils before, of course, but seeing these fossils, marine animals from the dawn of animal life at the top of a mountain with their beautifully preserved appendages and organs, rendered the idea of the Cambrian explosion a good le deal less theoretical for me than it had been. These complex sea creatures, now brushed by the thin air at ele an elevation of 7,500 feet in the middle of the Canadian Rockies, had apparently arisen suddenly, almost from nothing, by way of ancestral forms, in the sedimentary record. Everything about them cried out for a story, a big story. It set my mind and imagination racing. And having been there, it is an awesome sight. And there's some really awesome fossils up there, and of course there are more in museums down below. As wonderful as the fossils were, our trip to see them was made more memorable by two things that happened en route. One on the way up the mountain and one on the way down. As we were making our ascent, crossing a large teleslope, a section of the mountain void of vegetation and covered with only fragments of sedimentary rock, I heard my son unexpectedly call out to me from the, up at the t front of our group, where the young boys always are. Um, his voice had a trembling quality. I looked forward to see him, normally a fearless kid, blessed by energy without bound, standing locked in place, pale and wide-eyed. I stepped around several of the other hikers on the trail to catch up with him. It turned out he was experiencing a kind of vertigo. Though the mountain was not dangerously steep at that point, and we'll show a picture, as he set out across a path that cut through the rocky slope, he had made the mistake of looking down the mountain. Without trees as a reference point and with hundreds of feet of loose rock fragments above and beneath him, he became disoriented and frightened. And that's kind of the trail. And I guess it was a place somewhat like this where there's no trees. There's nothing growing. It's just teleslope. And... Uh, I steadied him as we walked in step, stride for stride, with me directly behind him across that open stretch of the mountain. Before long, we were back to a place on the trail where the trees and other plants appeared, providing a steadying presence as a point of reference. My son's perspective quickly returned. He relaxed and soon was smiling and leaping confidently ahead of me again. On the way down the mountain, I had a striking interaction with a member of our group who gave voice to a different kind of disorientation. 
It began as a conversation between my son's friend and our official field guide, who had been assigned to us by the local Burgess Shale Geoscience Foundation. Our guide was a paleontologist and did a terrific job. He told many a fine story about the geological history of the surrounding formations, about the discovery of the fossils, and of course about evolutionary, the evolutionary history of animal life. In fact, just before we turned the final corner on the trail to ascend to a large collection of excellent fossils available for viewing at the top of the mountain, he slipped a statement of support for evolutionary orthodoxy into his description of the fossil site. Our guide was clearly unaware that many of us in the group knew the fossils we were about to see challenged the standard Darwinian theory. We had made an issue of our views, of course, but nearly all the scientists on the hike were skeptical of neo-Darwinism. Paul Chien, the University of San Francisco marine biologist who had worked with J.Y. Chen in China on the sponge embryo fossils, was on the trip, and he had more than a passing acquaintance with the Cambrian era paleontology as did several of the Canadian geologists with us. Still, not wanting to introduce any needless discord, we carefully avoided engaging the issue. We just wanted to see the fossils. I, I might say that on uh, uh, our, my personal trip, um, the, uh, <laughs> the uh, questions uh, uh, started on the way up the mountain, not, not just on the way down. As we descended the mountain, however, my son's young friend asked our guide how he squared what we had just seen with his support for Darwinian evolution. You know, the kids just don't know when to keep, keep quiet, I guess. Uh, the guide at first maintained his commitment to the Darwinian party line. He said he th thought that Darwin would feel vindicated by the discovery of the Burgess fossils. This proved too much for the precocious intellectual teenager who loudly blurted out, what, Darwin would feel vindicated? By the sudden appearance of all these animals without any ancestors in the fossil record? Are you kidding? You would have to know this endearing young man to understand how his uninhibited outburst only charmed and amused our guide. But fortunately, it did. The rest of us, however, were initially mortified. This was the discussion we were trying to avoid, knowing exactly the intense emotions it often provokes. With scientists, it is generally safer to discuss religion and politics. <laughs> Nevertheless, to his credit, our guide took the challenge in stride. He explained how the Burgess fossils demonstrated evidence of change over time, how the rock column showed the great age of the Earth, and how the discovery of the fossils high on a mountain revealed the evolution of the planet. Our young friend had spent too much time reading up on the subject to let the point go at that. He brushed aside the issue of the Earth's age, which, like our guide, he reckoned in billions of years, and assured the man that he accepted evidence for change over time in the sedimentary record. He didn't question evolution in that sense. He questioned Darwinian evolution. Where is the evidence of gradual change, he demanded as his teenage voice cracked with excitement as it moved into the upper register. He continued, what mechanism could produce so many new animals so quickly? An odd thing happened then. The paleontologist, now leading us down the trail, suddenly ceased to act the part of guide. He dropped any pretense of superior authority and said, you know, I've wondered about that myself. I thought I could hear in his voice the candid amazement of the 14-year-old boy he once was. How do you explain it, he asked my son's friend. Our young spokesman confidently piped up and asserted intelligent design, of course. At which point, our guide began to ask the probing questions. Soon my son's friend had exhausted his soar of knowledge and began to look to me to join the conversation. I did so reluctantly at first. I explained the information argument for intelligent design and how the Cambrian explosion contributed to it. Our guide asked me the hard questions. How can we detect design? Is intelligent design science? Aren't we just arguing from ignorance and giving up on science? Or at least mainstream evolutionary science too soon? He also wanted to know what I, who I personally thought the designer was. His challenges were tough and honest. A terrific conversation ensued. 
When we reached the trailhead, he surprised me, thanking me for the conversation and thanking my young friend for starting it. He then spoke a bit more personally and revealed that he sometimes found thinking about biological origins disturbing. He said that as a scientist, he was committed to the evolutionary perspective, but he also found its denial of purpose depressing. He wondered if there was some, kind, some way to affirm both science and the kind of purpose and meaning that in life that religion speaks about. As we parted ways, he said that he would like to learn more about intelligent design. He told me he was intrigued by the perspective we were developing. I felt that we had made a genuine human connection rather than, as sometimes happens in the evolution debate, merely flinging assertions at one another. Over the years, as I've researched and thought about biological origins, I've had numerous simil similar conversations with people of many persuasions and backgrounds. Religious and non-religious, scientists, engineers, medical doctors, businessmen and women, appliance repairmen and taxi drivers. These conversations usually start innocently enough as a result of someone asking me what I do for a living. Though I often e euphemize my response, I, I work for a research organization. To avoid getting trapped in a heavy conversation on an airplane or over a broken wash dishwasher, often the conversations come whether I want them or not. People are interested in how life began, and they instinctively understand that whatever theory we adopt has larger philosophical, religious, or worldview implications. People are usually energized by considering these larger implications and questions. Many would like to find a way to harmonize the evidence from science with the view of the world that addresses their deepest existential longings as human beings, their yearnings for purpose and significance. But like our guide, many have been frustrated by the difficulty of arriving at a coherent synthesis. It's not hard to see why. On the one hand, many people of faith have little real interest in what science has to say about life's origins. Indeed, many well-meaning religious believers have adopted a view of the relationship between science and faith that rejects the testimony of science as irrelevant or even dangerous and affirms that just reading the Bible will give all the insight needed to understand how life came to be. Their approach does not really attempt to harmonize faith and science, since it takes faith in the Bible, and often a particular interpretation of the Bible, as the only reliable source of information about life's origins. It's hard to do that if you're a science or a science-related professional. On the other hand, many scientists and others who think that science has something to teach us about the big questions have started by assuming the neo-Darwinian account of biological origins, despite its many scientific difficulties, and despite its denial of any role for the purposive, intelli of for purposive intelligence in the history of life. In particular, two popular ideas about how Darwinism informs worldviews have come to different conclusions about the worldview it affirms or allows. The first view, the new atheism, has been articulated by spokesmen such as Richard Dawkins in his book The God Delusion and the late Christopher Hitchens in God is Not Great. It purports to refute the existence of God as a failed hypothesis. Well, as another new atheist book puts it, why? Because, according to Dawkins and others, there is no evidence of design in nature. Indeed, Dawkins' argument for atheism hinges upon his claim that natural selection and random mutation can explain away all appearances of design in nature. And since he asserts the design argument always provided the strongest argument for believing in God's existence, belief in God, he concludes, is extremely improbable, tantamount to a delusion. For the new atheist, Darwinism makes theistic belief both implausible and unnecessary. As Dawkins has famously put it, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. But nothing about the new atheism was actually new. Instead, it represents a popularization of a science-based philosophy called scientific materialism. As British philosopher and mathematician Bertrand Russell put it early in the 20th century, man is the product of causes which had no provision, no prevision of the end they were achieving, 
and which predestine him to extinction in the vast death of the solar system. An alternative and increasingly popular view is known as theistic evolution, popularized by Christian geneticist Francis Collins in his book, The Language of God, also published in 2006. This perspective affirms the existence of God and the Darwinian account of biological origins, yet it provides few details about how God might or might not influence the evolutionary process or how to reconcile seemingly contradictory claims in the Darwinian and Judeo-Christian accounts of origins. Darwinism and Neo-Darwinism insist that the appearance of design in living organisms is an illusion because the mechanism that produces that appearance is unguided and undirected. Does God, in Collins' view, guide the unguided process of natural selection? He and many other theistic evolutionists don't say. This ambiguity has left many questions unanswered. In fairness, many theistic evolutionists would argue that not all such questions can be answered because science and faith occupy separate, non-overlapping re realms of inquiry, knowledge, and experience. The argument of this book presents a scientific challenge to both of these views. In the first place, the evidence and arguments we have seen show that the scientific premise of the new atheist argument is flawed. The mechanism of mutation and natural selection does not have the created power attributed to it and thus cannot explain all appearances of design in, a, in life. The neo-Darwinian mechanism does not explain, for example, either the new genetic or epigenetic information necessary to produce fundamentally new animal body plans. This book has presented four separate scientific critiques demonstrating the inadequacy of the neo-Darwinian mechanism, the mechanism that Dawkins assumes can produce the appearance of design without intelligent guidance. It has shown that the neo-Darwinian mechanism fails to account for the origin of genetic information because, in one, it has no means of efficiently searching combinatorial sequences, sequence space for functional genes and proteins. In other words, it has no prevision. And consequently, two, it requires unrealistic long waiting times to generate even a single gene or protein. It can't do it in the time allowed. It has also been shown that the mechanism cannot produce new body plans because three, early acting mutations, the only kind capable of generating large scale changes, are also invariably deleterious. Unless you get very, very, very lucky. And Four, genetic mutations cannot in any case generate the epigenetic information necessary to build a body plan. That there's more than just the genetic information. Thus, despite the commercial success of the God delusion and its wide cultural currency, the new atheist philosophy lacks credibility because it has based its understanding of the metaphysical implications of modern science on a scientific theory that itself lacks credibility. Even as even many leading evolutionary biologists now acknowledge. And you notice there's a footnote there listing for you. Second, this book poses a strong challenge to theistic evolutionists such as Francis Collins for many of the same scientific reasons. Collins places great trust in modern Darwinism as a unifying theory of biology, but seems completely unaware of the formidable scientific problems now afflicting the theory. In particular, the challenges to the creative power of the natural selection mutation mechanism. He makes no attempt to address or answer any of these challenges. In addition, many of his arguments for universal common descent, the defense of which was his main concern in the language of God, are based upon the alleged presence of, presence of non-functional or junk elements in the genome of different organisms. The, Though the theory of intelligent design, which Collins says he opposes, does not necessarily challenge this part, common descent, of Darwinian theory, the factual basis of his arguments has now also largely evaporated as the result of ENCODE and other developments in genomics. Thus, this popular view of biological origins and its conceptions of 
of God's relationship to the natural world, now stands starkly at odds with the evidence. But why attempt to reconcile traditional Christian theology with Darwinian theory, as Collins tries to do, if the theory itself has begun to collapse? The perspective of this book offers a potentially more coherent and satisfying way of addressing the big questions of synthesizing science and metaphysics or faith than either of the currently popular views on offer. The Cambrian explosion, like evolutionary theory itself, raises a larger worldview questions precisely because it raises questions of origin and of design, and with them the question that all worldviews must address. What is the thing or entity from which everything comes? But unlike strict Darwinian materialism and the new atheism built atop it, the theory of intelligent des design affirms the reality of designer, a mind or personal intelligence behind life. This case for design restores to Western thought the possibility that human life in particular may have a purpose or significance beyond temporary material utility. It suggests the possibility that life may have been designed by an intelligent person, indeed one that many would identify as God. Unlike the theistic evolution of Francis Collins, however, the theory of intelligent design does not seek to confine the activity of such an agency to the beginning of the universe, conveying the impression of a decidedly remote and impersonal deistic entity. Nor does the theory of intelligent design merely assert the existence of a creative intelligence behind life. It identifies and detects activity of the designer of life and does so at different points in the history of life, including the explosive show of creativity on display in the Cambrian event. The ability to detect design makes belief in an intelligent designer or a creator or God not only a tenet of faith but something to which the evidence of nature now bears witness. In short, it brings science and faith into real harmony. Just as importantly, perhaps, the case for design supports us in our existential confrontation with the void and the seeming meaninglessness of physical existence. The sense of survival for survival's sake that falls, follows inexorably from the materialist worldview. Richard Dawkins and other new atheists may find it untroubling, even amusing and certainly profitable, to muse over the prospect of a universe without purpose. But for the vast majority of thoughtful people, that idea is tinged with terror. Modern life suspends many of us, so we feel, high over a chasm of despair. It provokes feelings of dizzying anxiety, in a word, vertigo. The evidence of a purposeful design behind life, on the other hand, offers the prospect of significance, wholeness, and hope. If I can get the next slide to show. As my son walked out across the mountain high above the Yoho Valley, he was surrounded by many slabs of rock containing some of the very fossils we had come to see. But as he surveyed that barren portion of landscape, he lost perspective on where he was and what he had come to do. Without landmarks or studying points of reference, he felt as if he were lost in a sea of sensory impressions. Without his sense of balance, he feared even to take a step. He called out for his father. It occurred to me only much later how closely his experience parallels, parallels our own as human beings trying to make sense of the world around us. To gain a true picture of the world and our place in it, we need facts, empirical data. But we also need perspective, something sometimes called wisdom, the reference points that a coherent view of the world provides. Historically, that wisdom was provided for many men and women by the traditions of Western monotheism, by our belief in God. The theory of intelligent design generates both excitement and loathing because in addition to providing a compelling explanation of the scientific facts, it holds out the promise of help in integrating two things of supreme importance, science and faith, that have long been seen at odds. The theory of intelligent design is not based upon religious belief, nor does it pr provide a proof for the existence of God. But it does have faith-affirming implications precisely because it suggests the design we observe in the natural world is real, just as a traditional theistic view of the world would lead us to expect. Of course, that by itself is not a reason to accept the theory, 
But having accepted it for other reasons, it may be a reason to find it important. My take mirrors that last two sentences. This chapter is not a logical reason to accept intelligent design or any of its implications. On the other hand, it is a reason to pay close attention to the valid arguments for and against ID. We will extend those arguments further next week. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. I, uh, since nobody else seems to want to say something, I'll, I want to confuse the picture. <clears throat> I think it needs confusing. Uh, probably we should stand by the terms that were used here in this uh, chapter. The contrast between science and faith. Um, I think, I think, uh, I accept the terms the way they're stated there to a certain extent, but uh, it seems to me that when you look at this picture from a rational perspective, you may have to ask the question, which requires more faith? The scientific perspective right now or the faith perspective right now as uh, seems to be defined in this book here. Uh, I, I, this is confusing. And of course, you know, even the title of this sadhu. Uh, faith in science. Faith in science. Uh, certainly certain aspects of, uh, like the original life, require the scientific perspective it requires a lot more faith uh, than if you have evidence for design, you say, well, no, there's a designer. It seems to me that uh, uh, terms like uh, rational, irrational might better define uh, the issue I'm trying to raise here, but uh, I realize that uh, people aren't in that mode of thinking. But I think it's something we need to think about, and that is, uh, if you're going to rationally, and I think basically our, we, we determine what is true basically, I think, on, on the basis of uh, evidence. Uh, now it's true we like uh, to talk about, well, we have faith in the Bible, and that's where we start, and, and uh, I might state, uh, through my younger years and so on, working with the general conference uh, folks, uh, they kind of took that position. That, and uh, I never was completely in full agreement with this because I felt always that uh, I want some basis for my faith. I want to, uh, otherwise I'll believe in the Book of Mormon or Alice in Wonderland or Iliad and Odyssey and so on. Uh, if I somewhere here, I've got I've got to uh, uh, pick that which seems most rational. Anyway, uh, I realize this confuses though the, the the terminology that is used in this book. But uh, I wonder if irrational and rational wouldn't be better terms of what we're uh, thinking about here. Uh, so it does require a lot of faith, some faith in, to believe in, in the Bible. But it requires more faith, at least as far as I'm concerned, to believe in atheism or even um, naturalism, if you don't want to use that term, uh, pejorative term, atheism. So uh, uh, we have minds and we can look at things and uh, I like to pick that which is, seems most reasonable uh, and not let these terms that we're using right now uh, confuse the issue. So 
I'll just leave it at that right now and uh, see what uh, others may want to say about it. I'm hitting the back here. The Book of Romans, of course, suggests that there is ample evidence for us to see. I wonder what the people of that time saw because me looking <laughs> today, yeah, I accept nature as it is, but I, it doesn't tell me a whole lot. I have to make inferences. And while I love sweet little bunnies, uh, animals that kill and eat are a bit of a shock to explaining anything. I also wonder about the delay, the time that it's taken for us to find God and I'm wondering if all of this genetics and epigenetics and the discoveries of science will come to the place where they will persuade us that there was, in fact, an intelligent designer uh, that had to be involved. On the other hand, I look at the world today and it's horror, and I have to question why God's waiting. For what? Is it because we do not have enough... Uh, genetic intelligence to, to find God. Uh, In which case, if you wait longer, are we going to get any better? Yeah. Wouldn't it be easy for him to do something supernatural that would persuade us? Why must we wait for something more explicit in the world today? Does anybody have uh, Romans 1? And we can read maybe what... Um, uh, uh, you can start with... Uh, start with... Uh, verse 18 and then um, continue on to verse uh, 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and God, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew him, when they knew God, as they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but he was vain in their imaginations, and a foolish heart was dug. Okay, so... If we're looking at this, there are two things that it says that, that can be drawn from nature. And interestingly enough, uh, the love of God is not one of them. That his, his eternal power and Godhead are the two things that can be drawn from nature. And that's about as far as you can get. There's someone out there who knows an awful lot and can do an awful lot. <laughs> it's not a complete gospel. In fact, it's not a gospel at all if you want to put it that way because it's not the good news. The good news is that that person loves us. A um, couple of comments, uh, Mickey, and uh, and then uh, Nick. You know, this discussion of faith, always I've enjoyed this uh, quote by Ellen White, um, you know, because usually it's an issue of should we have more faith or some people have less faith. She says, faith is the medium through which truth or error finds a lodging place in the mind. It is the same act, it is by the same act of mind that truth or error is received. So, 
Um, so yeah. having faith in something doesn't make that more true necessarily. You still have to have a discriminatory, you still have to manifest judgment uh, in filling in those gaps. So faith is the medium through which truth or error finds a lodging place in the mind. Nick? I have a, a comment and a question. Uh, you, some of you probably remember that uh, Francis Collins was here on campus a few years ago. And he was invited by the graduates to give uh, his speech. And he started by saying, I've been tempted to read to you the DNA code. But uh, I changed my mind when I figured out that it would take 32 years of nonstop reading to do that. Now, when I learned that, what, uh, what he said, I immediately went and purchased his book. Because I thought, here is a man who really believes in intelligent design and, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe agrees with my views. I was disappointed, of course, when I read his book. And uh, my question is, do we know what his reaction is today? Uh, many years after he wrote his book, because now that we know that junk DNA is, is, uh, uh, does not stand on the uh, firm, uh, then do we know what he thinks now? Has he changed his views, or does he still believe in junk DNA? Well, I think that there are two things that have happened. Number one is he has become... Uh, I think it's head of NIH. Um, and so uh, he has become much more muted about what he wants to say about anything because he's now a political figure. And political figures don't have the same freedom to say things as people who are uh, renowned scientists but don't have a public position they have to uh, uh, I would say defend almost. Um, the second thing is that his comments about junk DNA have gotten much quieter. Now, does that mean he's changed his mind or does that mean that the politics have intervened or does that mean that he's seriously thinking about it but doesn't know which way he wants to go? I don't know. I do know that I, I was amazed to listen to him on the radio and to note that he argued for, very clearly, that God started the universe. And I think he does that in his book as well. And he also argued that God put the moral sense into our heart. Those are testable propositions and those also as far as we know require intelligent design designing the universe has got to be one of the most if not the most intelligent uh, thing uh, job one would ever have to, to to do and certainly would also require a great deal of power to make things work the way they're supposed to um, on the other hand, uh, putting a moral sense in us has to be second or third or something very close to that because we have no clue as to how to put moral sense into each other or ourselves. And as a matter of fact, uh, the failure to put moral <laughs> sense into people is, is uh, rather evident at times. Um, we have no clue as to how to rewire the brain to make that work. Or is it even rewiring the brain? Is there a mind that's kind of separate from the brain that uses the brain as a kind of a, a receptor in order to make contact with the rest of the world? We don't know. Um, 
it almost makes you wonder when you realize that every single thing you have ever seen and understood is remembered somewhere upstairs. And if you try to do that in a physical way, I'm not sure we have the capacity to do that. Maybe Google knows how to do that. Google doesn't know either. Believe me, if we knew how, we'd have uh, intelligent, uh, we'd have artificial intelligence. And we don't. Can I add uh, another anecdote? Uh, some years ago, there was a former uh, president of Andrews University teaching the Sabbath school lesson, and you may have been there. And he talked about the problem, uh, you know, in Genesis, uh, the, the fact that the two stories we have there don't exactly relate the events in the same way. And then a student, a former student of his, raised his hand and he said, how come you never told us when I was your, st your student at Andrews University? And he responded, I didn't want to rock the boat. So regarding Collins, I, I, I understand what you said, that maybe for political reasons he may not feel free to really tell us what he thinks. Now, the thing that I find interesting is that if you believe that God interfered at the Big Bang, assuming the Big Bang happened, you are now an intelligent design advocate. You believe there is, there is some evidence that points to a God outside of nature that can fiddle with nature. Perhaps only at the beginning, but you are actually an intelligent design advocate. You know, you can say you don't believe that God intervened at the origin of life. Maybe, maybe not. Um, you can say that God didn't intervene at the Cambrian explosion. But if you, if you have God intervening at the beginning, you're an intelligent design believer. And if you believe that God intervened to put a moral sense into people, however far back that was and however many people it involved, you are also an intelligent design believer. Because the whole point of the exercise of what some people will call science. I don't like to call it science because I think that it gives up the word to, uh, to a particular party unfairly. But there are people who say that the job of science is to explain the natural world without reference to anything outside of itself. That's the job of the natural world. And you have just denied that that job works in two different places you are now an intelligent design believer. And guess what? Francis Collins caught heat for those positions from the atheists who did not want him to head the NIH because he might bias science somehow. Um, I guess you've been waiting longer than uh, Brian Bull. The degree of integration that's required for learning you were speaking about a little bit ago. In the Gospel of John, when Jesus heals the man who was born blind, it specifically says that that miracle was for, especially for the last days. I mean, people couldn't know how much is required to integrate the occipital cortex, superior olivary nuclei, eyes, you know, on the whole nervous system as well as the understanding. So that when the man saw, I mean, it takes a long time for a, a kid to begin to integrate what he's doing. I mean, that, that kind of miracle is astounding, and I, I appreciate that it was really meant for the last days, as John said. 
because we can understand what happened. And it's miraculous. Um, and what's even more interesting is that, that the rewiring was done, one, in terms of time, very rapidly, and two, without destroying the man's sense of his own personality. He had the perfect out when people were, well, isn't that the guy that was at the gate? Uh, yeah, that's him, all right. Nah, but he sure looks like him. And he could have said, you know, I remember the guy. But kind of vaguely, it's not you, really me. Are you talking about the one that the Peter and Paul, I mean, Paul and... Je no, I'm talking about the man the born man blind. The man born blind, okay. But, uh, you read the, read the account in John 9, and it'll tell you yeah. that, it's, that there, were, there was and, some yeah. debate as to whether, you know, that can't be the right guy. Yeah, but, they, but he sure looks like him. And they even ask his parents, is this your son? Yes. Was he born blind? Ask him. He's of age. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have no idea how it's done. Yeah. But, yeah, to understand what it would take to innervate the brain in such a way to actually make it work now for someone of that age. I mean, it's, it's as miraculous as turning, probably more so than turning water into wine. Yeah. I mean, you can see that a little easier, but the same principle, I mean... Well, the, 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 I think the point is that if you believe that God put a moral sense into us, and I think that you could argue that at the new birth he puts it back again after it's been destroyed or distorted, uh, that that miracle is as much of a miracle as having the man born blind realize that that was him when he was born blind. You gotta wonder if when we are transformed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, if that knowledge of good and evil is somehow displaced. That I don't know. Because I came from the tree and we aren't gonna be dealing with the tree again after. Our yeah. memories will be there but I mean, that may be why there w sin will never rise again. That bent that was given from that first, you know, situation. I don't know. It's well, when God converts people, they still <clears throat> remember the old life. Well, that I understand, right. But remembering the old life and being bent by the knowledge of good and evil are two different things. Yeah. Go ahead. It seems to me we have... Um, it's on. It's on. That um, we have um, taken uh, Meyer's definitions and we're running with them, and I'm not sure that we should have bought into them quite that easily. He has distinguished between what he refers to as intelligent design and the uh, approach of um, Francis <coughs> Collins by laboring Francis Collins as a deist, I. I, I, would well, I would agree with you. I think that, uh, that he's not really I don't think a he's deist. a deist. And I would submit that any Christian who accepts the existence of God, and therefore would be a theist, and um, sees uh, that God as acting in the, by way of miracle in the world, even if only occasionally. And even if only uh, unprovably in the scientific sense. Is probably the way you've enlarged it is probably a believer in intelligent design. So I think he's only got one category there. He's got theists and Darwinian evolutionists. And there I can see a, a distinction, but I think he's been unkind to Francis Collins. Because I'm pretty sure Francis would not consider himself a deist. Uh, in fact, um, most of these people don't consider themselves deists. What I think is probably fair to say is that in one sense they're practical deists, in that none of the interventions that God makes. I mean, uh, for example, Kenneth Miller suggests that maybe God works in terms of quantum I uncertainty making, you know, in other words, he loads the dice a little bit, so to speak, so that a tiny mutation is actually planned. 
rather than being that makes them an intelligent design advocate well the interesting thing of it is of course is that Kenneth Miller would loudly tell you and Francis Collins at one time would loudly tell you I don't know what he'd say now that he is not an intelligent design person well may I suggest then that the the problem is the fact that intelligent design by definition is a very slippery concept it goes all the way from people uh, who view intelligent design as God creating the universe and making it, um, making it favorable towards life, uh, down to those people who would look for the evidence of God in the formation of the motor that drives the bacterial flagellum. And somewhere in between there, I think all Christians would find a convenient stopping place. But I'm not quite sure that that it, this helps us in our in our present situation, because we're all by by that sort of definition, we all believe in intelligent design. If we're Christians and if we accept miracle, I, I think so. I think that, uh, for example, the resurrection. If you believe in a bodily resurrection, you're stuck with intelligent design. So. Where are we as Adventists in terms of having made progress? I, I note again, as I um, saw once before when I um, came by here, that that they both believed that the Earth is extremely old, and ni none of them accept flood geology. And I'm still puzzled as to this this uh, as to where we've arrived at. Can you help me out here? I think that the one thing that we have done is we have made it comfortable for somebody to believe that there is a God out there who can actually intervene because there's pretty good evidence that he does, in fact, intervene and has. And I think that we have made it very uncomfortable to be an atheist because you have these huge holes precisely where uh, a God theory predicts they would be. And, and I think that that one point means that the vast majority of scientists, well, maybe not the vast majority, but certainly the majority and certainly the controlling majority, of scientists, in fact, are barking up the wrong tree. And what it does is it takes the equation of science equals truth and science equals atheism and therefore atheism equals truth. It takes that out of the picture. And I, I'll elaborate on that, I think, more next week. Because once you break that triple equation that truth equals science equals atheism, that you go about trying to solve the problems with a, an entirely different approach. Forty percent of scientists would acknowledge it. I think a personal God and uh, a God who answers prayer. That's right. Um, a, a significantly larger percentage of scientists would acknowledge a God and probably would accept the the possibility of miracle. So uh, help me out. What exactly is the the major change that will now occur? Um, that the push to answer everything on the basis of matter energy, law, and chance, with no contribution of intelligence whatsoever, is in fact a push to force a round peg into a square hole. Yes, but you know as, as well as I do that any scientist in the laboratory always, um, whether they admit it or not, and depending on how honest they are, whether they write it in their papers or not, always works on the basis of pursuing the answer that makes the most sense. 
Now, I know we're not supposed to do that, but I, um, having spent my life in the laboratory, I know that both I and all other scientists do. Since the majority of scientists are religious in, in, in some sense, I'm still puzzled as to 40% would say that they believe in a God that answers prayer, and a, a, lot, a larger number, Einstein for instance, would accept a force active in the universe that and when we design our experiments, we always look for the kinds of things that we as designers would have done in order to answer or in order to, to understand this, this particular physiological phenomenon. What, it, what way will this make sense in the, in, in the future of this creature? And then we go looking for that. We don't randomly just sort of... Um, so we're all design advocates in that sense. You mean things like uh, you, you see a protein in a cell and you say, what does it do, instead of saying, does it do anything? Well, you, you say the cell needs certain things done. This isn't the right place to do them. Maybe it is the protein that does it. Yeah. That, that in, a sense, in a sense, our initial assumption is that it's doing something, that, that we don't find it easy when we uh, uh, when we look at um, well, let well, me give you an illustration here. I spent um, probably three or four years um, on the basis of why trying to find out why the red cell is the shape that it is. And it's a very beautiful biconcave shape, and it and it's also very flexible. And I had seen a film when I was perhaps 12 years old from the Moody Bible Institute saying that it was this shape because it was the optimal shape for gas exchange. It allowed CO2 and oxygen to go in and come out and be carried around the body. Most surface area, whatever. Yeah, but even as a 12-year-old, I knew that couldn't be true because the most optimal shape for gas exchange would be a very thin pancake. Much Rather than the biconcave. Yeah, yeah. So when I got to the point where I could do experiments along these lines, that's what I set out to find out. Well, it turns out that it is the most optimal shape for gas exchange, but for a very surprising and unusual reason, which I'd need to give a one-hour lecture to explain exactly how it works. But um, what was driving me there is intelligent design. This cell looks like it's serving a, a purpose, and it turns out it is. Now my question is, what advance have we made by these considerations over what scientists always have done down through the centuries and continue to do? Um, people like Dawkins um, actually doesn't, and Dawkins does very little science, mostly he spends his time um, inveighing against people who are not atheists. Most scientists operate on the basis of the fact that the world and the cell and, and life itself must be intelligently designed. I think that what happens right now, even though they are in the, depending on how you define it, minority or certainly a slim majority. And this may explain why they are so terrified that they're going to lose their power is because they realize that it rests upon a very thin foundation. And they see intelligent design people as part of creationists, as part of the right wing, as part of, you know, and we're Christian, all re Christian reconstructionists and we're ready to take over the world and legislate Sunday. Well, maybe we'd legislate the Sabbath, but <laughs> you know, they're they're afraid uh, that they're going to lose some power that they have right now. Uh, if you if you just read what they have to say about creationist intelligent design people, they'll say you that up front. At least some of the more influential of them will. Um, you read Barbara Forrest and Paul Gross, and you find out that a lot of the, you know, the people who are running around on the internet trying to persuade everybody that that evolution is true, 
and descending upon places like Ball State and trying to cancel intelligent design uh, uh, classes, uh, doing the same thing at Amarillo College. Um, they, if you ask them, they will say Barbara Forrest has it right. This is a huge conspiracy. And, and right now, those people have the ear of most of the media. If you go for, uh, especially all the, um, the mainstream media, as it's sometimes called, if you go to the New York Times, you're going to get exactly the same spiel. These are all right wingers who are, you know, trying to take over the country. They're they got no science behind them, but they are uh, and and they're ready to be attacked. You know, they're they're just they're they're they're. And I think if we can take that one piece out, we're going to look at the way to fit science and faith and religion and reason all together in an entirely different way, which I'll try to detail next week. So come on back. Yeah, I was wondering what, what would happen if scientists that are doing research were, if their study what if the constraint of the methodological naturalism were, were removed, what would happen in science? And another question is, can you help me understand the difference between theism with D, as in David, and theism with T, and, uh, and its relation to uh, design, uh, intelligent design? Well, theism is the Greek pronunciation, deism is the Latin. Uh, but beyond that, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Deus, Dominus, uh, Theos. Uh, but the reason that they have that slight difference is because a deist is somebody who believes that God started the whole thing and then he just kind of sat back and he's watching. But he won't interfere. Once he let it go, he let it go. As far as our physical world is going, we're on our own. God never steps in. He never produces miracles. Um... If you accept that, then you're a deist. And the practical implications are that, yes, if you go back far enough, you can get origins and God and evidence for God. But as far as once the ball got rolling, forget about it. And that means as well in our personal lives, and that means in history. A thoroughgoing deist cannot believe in the miracles of Jesus, for example. Or if he does believe, he'll believe in a kind of a half-baked thing where perhaps in the sermon on the, or perhaps at the feeding of the 5,000, what happened was one little boy volunteered his lunch and everybody said, oh, you know what, the lunch that I've been hiding because who knows when it's going to be required and then maybe somebody else will take it from me. I should take it out and share it too. And so everybody you know, and there was really plenty of food out there. It was just that people were not, not using it. You see, the idea that God could actually multiply bread and fish in one particular setting, taking one boy's lunch and then feeding a whole multitude and having more left over than the boy had at the beginning, that just can't happen. It's physically impossible, and God doesn't intervene, so there you have it. How about theist? How about What's the what? Difference? What's the difference between 
theists and the, the, theists. Well, the theist could say, you know what? If God wanted to multiply bread and fish, he can do it. We don't know exactly how does he take you know, molecules out of the nearby Sea of Galilee and bring them towards Jesus' hand? Does he create new molecules ex nihilo? Um, how do they integrate with the rest of it? Um, do they have the DNA of fish or do they just taste like fish? You know, those are kinds of questions that, that the theist wouldn't be able to answer. But he would say that God can do it. He can do it in a number of different ways. And however he happened to do it, that's the way it happened. Well, if the Catholic Church can perform transubstantiation, why wouldn't Jesus be able to do something else? Well, actually, transubstantiation is an interesting case because from what I understand, the theology is that the inner substance of the bread and wine are transformed into the body and blood of Jesus. But the outer... Uh, the is, is a form and there's a substance, I think it is, and the outer form stays the same. So that, for example, if you were to take right after the blessing, uh, you were to take the bread and look at it, it would still have wheat. Which is why it doesn't bleed until they break it. Well, yeah, but if you break it, if you photograph it and you don't see blood, they say, well, you know, it's just the outside is really, the, the form is, is bread. The, the inner substance that you can't see is the body of Jesus. So th that's a miracle, yes, but it's not testable. You, if, you, if you were to try to test it, you would find that there would be no difference between that bread and any other bread. See, what we're talking about is miracles that could actually be tested. You know, when they got done, they had these baskets full of leftovers. They started out with less, and the implication of the story is that the people didn't actually start supplying Jesus with bread, that what happened was that they, that Jesus just kept distributing bread and there was more bread and more bread and more bread. But the test that you'd have to frisk everyone who went in to make sure they were sent to their slows of the fishes before they got... That is true. But sometimes it gets pretty easy to frisk, such as the death of Lazarus or the death of Jesus himself. You see, guys been dead four days, you know, by now, uh, you really don't want to go in there. You know. They probably didn't have any Piscine meters back then. They wanted to scan them, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, obviously their ability to detect death is less than ours, although I will tell you something, that uh, I have had people who we gave up on CPR and then their hearts started beating again, so uh, it can get rather interesting even today. But, but you know, at four days, nah, come on, folks, the, you know, this, this guy's dead. And then he comes back to life again. Well, we know of no natural process. We know of no physician process. So can, if, can, if you're going to be a, if you're going to be a, just to finish up, if you're going to be a, a, a deist, you have to say Lazarus wasn't really raised. Or else you have to say, well, they didn't really get close enough to smell because they didn't want to get, but he was actually resting in the tomb. Um, yeah, well, that's the point. Uh, both deism and theism, of course, mean believe in God. Uh, I think there is usage kind of defines uh, definition of terms. That's why it's, uh, right. uh, things get confused uh, very often because definition because usage changes. Uh, I think there's a slight difference between the two uh, in terms of general usage. Uh, Theist is a broad term for believing in God. Deism, there's been at least uh, a tendency to make it refer to a God that was active in the beginning but is not active now. Right. And so it's... Uh, uh, the there's, there's, a, there's a temporal, there's a temporal uh, 
picture in the deism right. that I don't see in theism. So when God was dead, he was a deist to begin with, back in the 60s. Um, well, those people looked at the concept of God as being dead. They didn't really even believe that there was ever a God. Um, there are, I, I mean, if you were to pin them down, that's what most of them would actually come out and say. Now, there probably are a few people that say, well, God was active back then, but he's no mm -hmm. longer active now, and so forget about it. But uh, that's one of the reasons why you want to be really careful about assuming people are what you think they are because uh, somebody says he's a, he doesn't believe in God, he doesn't believe in intelligent design, but, but God put this moral sense into us. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. That's a miracle. That's a, uh, at least partially testable miracle. Do you really believe that it was good at that time? I don't think it was acquired through social constructs? Um, well, let's put it this way. Francis Collins used that argument as a proof for God's existence. And you can't use it as a proof for God's existence unless you are saying that on an atheist model it shouldn't be there, and on our model God put it there. Now, how God put it there? You can debate. Which is why when the atheists argue about one of the greatest lessons we've ever learned was you know, about the uh, doing to others as you would have them do it. The good the good so the golden rule, you know, they claim is something that was learned by sociology kind of. Yes, and it depends on the atheist that you talk to whether that really is a good rule or not. You know, there are kind of Ayn Randian atheists who think that if, as long as we all follow our own selfish desires, uh, with, of course, uh, what would you call it? enlightened self-interest, I think is the way they'd put it, that if that happens, that everything will balance out in the end. Too many of those are doing it before it's done to them. Yeah. In a protective manner. Yeah, yeah. Evolutionary, I guess. Yeah. Uh, not surprisingly, as far as I know, Anne Rind was uh, an atheist. Of course. Yeah. Uh, comment here? Oh, okay. And then maybe we'll wrap it up with your do comment. Two things in the book of John really stand out. One of those is that this crazy story goes all over Jerusalem, says, Jesus is risen again, Jesus is risen again. Doubting Thomas says, I don't believe, unless I see. You see, a gentleman at the back made a comment, this needs to be a miracle today for the world to see and for everyone to believe. I wish he was here to ask what kind of a miracle would convince us Christians to believe that yes, our faith is okay. It's okay to be scientists and physicians and whatnot and still be Christians. What kind of miracle would we ask for from the Lord? You see, then it comes to Mary Magdalene, the prostitute in the upper chamber. She's watch, washing his feet. He says, leave her alone. Wherever this gospel is preached, this story is going to be told. So beautiful. You see, uh, we oh, blessed are the ones who believe without seeing. For a scientist who does not believe in a creator, I believe it's all about himself. It's all about himself. The ones who believe in the Creator, they, the glory goes to Him. You went to Romans chapter 1. Um, it says, the translation in New um, King James, it says, they suppress the truth. Mm -hmm. They suppress the truth. Then we go to verse 22. Professing to be wise, they become fools and challenge the glory of the incorruptible God. That is to say... It's really out there, and you have to kind of close your eyes to it in order to, in order to not see it. Now, of course, that's not what you will get from the new atheists. Maybe the new atheists are wrong.
just just going to come back to this question of definition of terms uh, and the faith and science Sabbath school. Uh, maybe we need to define what we mean by faith. Uh, of course, a scientist has to have faith that the laws of nature are going to be consistent. Uh, we all have to exert a certain amount of faith uh, if we're going to do any interesting thinking. Uh, but uh, maybe there there's different kinds of faith. The, the way uh, Meyer is using faith here, I think it's more along the well belief in the Bible, belief in creation, uh, and that that's one definition. Another one would be extension of uh, rationality. Uh, although I'd put the, those two as exactly the same action in my thinking. Uh, but uh, being perhaps almost facetious, uh, one could state that this faith in science Sabgo class means that faith is evolution and science means creation. Think about um, that's actually a defensible position, especially given signature in the cell and Darwin's doubt. I, I think that, uh, well certainly, Certainly, you can argue that for intelligent design. Now, the next question is, if you grant intelligent design, if you take the new atheists out of it, and you start saying there is a God and he can intervene in nature anytime he so chooses, where do we go from there? And, uh, well, we'll actually go from intelligent design to God next week, and then go from there. But... Um, but I think that the question is, is, is still, you know, does that change the way we approach natural history? I think it does, um, but we'll see what you guys think. Does it get more excited when you add judgment to your list of <laughs> things coming? <laughs> it probably gets more exciting, it gets more interesting, but I'm not sure that it changes the fundamental arguments. I think it gets more meaningful with judgment there. It, it does. It does. It's scary too, though, for people who don't understand it the way you do. Yeah. Anyway, see you all next week.